Two quick notes, listeners. First, on this episode, our guest Matthew Carroll talks about a song he wrote that is directly relevant to the show, and it will be played at the end of the episode. Secondly, for those who are curious about my other podcast, the Star Wars Universe podcast, I'm happy to say that we're coming back out of hiatus, that we have a new co-host, and our first episode will go up this week. Check it out. And now, on with the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Superhero Ethics Podcast. I'm Matthew, one of your hosts. Unfortunately, this week, Jacob can't be with us, but we're joined instead by Matt Carroll. You may remember Matt. He has been my co-host on the Orville Universe Podcast, and he's also the one of the founders and the co-hosts of the MCU cast, uh, the one that really inspired me to get this started, as well as a number of other podcasts, uh, including some that make it very relevant that he's here with us today to talk about Picard, the upcoming Star Trek TV show, and the uh, ethical questions they're in. So, Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. I am super excited about Star Trek these days. Me too, me too. Yeah, you want to, um, just to kind of fill in our listeners who may not know you, say a bit about uh, um, your interest in Star Trek and what you've been doing with it recently? All right, so <laughs> from from the top, uh, I I am a huge Star Trek fan. Uh, grew up with it from you know it's one of my it's probably my earliest fandom really. Uh, I was like six years old, you know, loving Star Trek. So been been a, been a fan a long time. Um, well, I, I say that about six years old is when my parents first made kind of forced me to sit down and watch it. <laughs> my mother as well. That's what she did. Yeah, we had one TV growing up, so you know after kind of being forced to sit in front of it because there was nothing else on. They wanted to watch Star Trek TNG, and so I just like, ah, fine, I'll sit here. And then, you know, over time, I just got to where I love Data and Jordy, man. They were my jam when I was six. And then uh, there's, the I think, the friendship, I guess. I don't know. Um, yeah. But over time, and, and the sort of novelty of the android, uh, but over time, just grew to love it. I've been a huge fan ever since, um, and love deep continuity. If anybody anybody on here listens to the MCU cast, you know the reason I love the Marvel Universe is because they at least attempt at a tight continuity, which I, I learned from Star Trek. So Star Trek is kind of my original or original sin of my fandom uh, is is my love for Star Trek, and I just I've I've loved a lot of things, and a lot of it's very like. I don't know, my entire, my entire framework for not just like for morality and to some degree, like the way I think is built on Star Trek, like the way Kirk always tries to find the third way, you know, uh, yeah. looking at a problem and trying to find the way out of it that uh, avoids the pitfalls. I, I just, I don't know. I, I think like Star Trek, like Star Trek is a huge part of my life, but uh, it, doing that, uh, we started the Star Trek universe podcast. And so we've been doing that for a, a, about a year now. And um, when we started doing our Picard rewatch, we call it the Picard Primer, where we're, we're rewatching episodes that are important to sort of what we think the Picard show is going to be about. So basically Picard, uh, Picard, Data, Borg, Romulans, and Seven of Nine is what we were going for. Watching specific episodes and movies based on that. I got so excited about this Picard show, I started writing songs about it. And so now... <laughs> Yeah, it. Uh, I this now, is the ultimate um, going deep moment. Yeah, no, and that's the thing is I'm not just like, hey, let's write a silly song. I'm like trying to really deconstruct every episode we cover and like find the emotional core and find where I interface with that emotional core and write a song that like really resonates with me personally. And so uh -huh. it's weird. I, it actually, you know, me, me and you both uh, uh, have have connections to the church. Yep. Um, I grew up in it. And, and what I re one thing I realized about what I'm doing when I'm writing these songs is I'm kind of doing what I did, at, what, what I grew up doing when people wrote like sort of songs about Christianity. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of like, and, and it's something that people don't do anymore. And I feel like they used to like Led Zeppelin and stuff used to be about like Tolkien. Um, but that's not a thing that's kind of cool anymore. And I, I just from writing these songs very built on Star Trek, and it's really been uh, super artistically fulfilling and super fun. Well, and I, I, I love that. I, I love everything about what you just said, and I'll, I'll kind of hit a couple things. One is, I've mentioned this in the podcast before, but I had a similar thing. My my mother was a huge Star Trek fan. Um, she loved the original series. Um, and so growing up, we would watch that when it was on syndication when I was a kid. 
and it was the same kind of thing. Like, I would be eight or nine years old, and, like, you know, we'd watch the episode about the, the aliens with the black face on one side and the white face on the other, and, and she and I would talk about it. And she'd ask, like, you know, how do you think this, this connects to what's happening in our own world? And it was really kind of the way my mother taught me ethics and, and taught me morality. And I, uh, I love hearing that that's true for other people, that Star Trek has been such a big part of people's lives. Um, I also really connected to what you said about the church, because um, in grad school, one of the, I took a number of courses on sociology of religion, and one of the things that we looked at quite a bit was the idea of, you know, what does a religion look like just from a sociological perspective of, you know, what are people doing and how is it imp- influencing them and, and how is it built? And from those definitions, like the sociological definition of a religion, one of the closest modern day equivalents is the Star Trek fandom, especially in terms of the way that it's, you know, a community built around shared texts, and then people get together and debate what do those texts mean, and which are canon and which are not, mm-hmm. and try to use them to influence how to shape their lives and stuff like that. And so, yeah, the, the connection you make there totally makes sense to me. Yeah, it's weird. I, I, there was There's a time in my life when saying that would feel blasphemous, uh, but yeah. I'm no longer in that time in my life. And it used to feel, um, I used to, when people would talk about TV shows that way, I used to uh-huh. feel like, oh, that's so, that's so uh, trite or I don't know, like they're, they're a little obsessive or something. And now yeah. where I am now in my life, I'm like, oh, it's no different. You know, it's just the same. If this is it, the danger, I guess, of treating these kinds of shows as if they are a religion. I don't think that's a good idea necessarily, but tr- yeah. treating them, uh, treating them because you're basically just working off something some other guy is writing but that, that that's the thing is like that's uh, as, as i believe today and i and i you know, you know i don't talk about this much on the on the cast too much but as i believe today that's kind of how i think all religions are um and yeah. they're all just things people wrote down because they felt or thought a certain thing and so i don't know it's it's been interesting it's i guess i guess in those cases a lot of times at least they were trying to yeah uh, come up with a system of morality, whereas Star Trek <laughs> is just trying to make entertaining TV. So uh, you got to be careful which episodes you uh, you invest yeah. yourself into. <laughs> well, and, and I would actually argue with that a bit. Because, first of all, I think um, it's funny because when you said it, it sounds blasphemous to you, I have to remember that you're, you, like me, come from a religious background because I think an awful lot of people would say, yeah, that's blasphemous. How dare you ever insult Star Trek by calling it a religion? <laughs> <laughs> so I think people would approach it on both sides. Um, but I, I do think, and I, um, uh, I, I want to talk more to, uh, uh, the, your partner on the Star Trek Universe podcast, Dave Robertson, would probably yeah. know more about this. But my, my memory is that, um, Gene Roddenberry was actually very intentionally wanting this to be a TV show that would teach people ethics, that would teach people morality. This very rot issue, we've talked about it many times on our, on our cast, uh, that is what he said in the 80s. Um, mm. after he had made the original series and it kind of had a thing like uh, at some point gene roddenberry went from being a guy who was trying to make what he called wagon train in space like he's trying to make a a western show but in space uh-huh. basically uh and, and obviously the, certain writers elevated it and other writers didn't other other episodes are very um you know basic just adventure stories yeah. um but he went from a guy trying to write that, and at some point, uh, I guess it, because a lot of other people started to see it like we're talking about, almost like a religion, um, I think that he started to believe his own press to some degree. And so that's yeah. actually – some of the biggest failings of the next generation to me are early next generation, Gene Roddenberry still had a lot of creative control, and he would really push back on there being things like conflict between characters because mm. – he wanted to believe in such a perfect future that our, our protagonists would never disagree. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, uh, he, at some point he started believing his own press and st- stopped, I don't know, just trying to entertain. Um, and I think to some degree for the, for, for the worse. Uh, but I, but I, I do believe, I mean, I believe all shows you should make with an intention to communicate something artistic. And in most, most ways, all art is sort of teach, is is teaching you know it's it's yeah it's all trying to say something about the human condition and try to uh set talk about bigger things it should be anyway good art and and it makes sense especially in terms of the um 
the things you you see in different generations. Um, my 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 mother. One of the reasons why she loved showing me Star Trek is she was very much a hippie. She was a person who was very involved in the '60s and uh, did a whole bunch of civil rights stuff, and 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 probably had flowers in her hair lots of times. And and she liked to talk about the fact that when she wanted me to understand the the fundamental hopefulness that was at the heart of so much of the attitude of the late 1960s, that Star Trek was one of the things that she liked to show because it, in her mind, it was so fundamentally a TV show about hope. Um, and and when she and I watched Next Generation, she remembered commenting that it, it felt a little off because the time that it was being made was not a time of hope in any, in the, in any way the same degree. And that I, I've always thought part of why the newer Star Trek start to get a lot better around DS9, and I know you feel the same way, it is in part because it, it moves away from being just, like you said, that Roddenberry idea of there's no conflict and everything is perfect, but into, well, what if there are still some, you know, bad apples within the Federation? Because that's the way the world works, and we're never going to be perfect, no matter what science and technology does for us. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that's... it's. I think that's definitely when Star Trek is at its best. I, I just think all art is better when there's gray area. Yeah. Um, and uh, we won't get on Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I do think it's funny that um, you're, you're a, a partner for the MCU. We're, we're sort of getting into a world now, and, and you're going to talk about this more at the end. Um, a, a number of these podcasts are going to all be coming together in something that Matt is building called the Stranded Panda Network. And I'll let you um, comment on that at the end. But, but I think it's funny because to some extent it's the same five or six people all just kind of mixing and matching and saying, oh, hey, how about the two of us make a podcast? And now the two of you make a podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that's that's kind of where it is now, but I'm hoping that we expand that as we go. And one of our yeah. one of our big shows that we're about to launch is hopefully not going to be any particular host. I'm hoping that it kind of rotates cast as it goes and – and I, I just I, I'd like to see bigger things happen, but yeah, we we only know who we know, and at this point, yeah. we've got a few podcasts that are mildly successful, and it's like <laughs> trying to get them uh, trying to get them all kind of crossing the streams and building on each other's audiences and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, well, but you're right, it is it is very uh, <laughs> incestuous right now. Every everything's crossing over into each other. Well, I was saying that just because um, the person who is your co-host off the MCU cast, Jeff, he is about to become my main co-host for the uh, Star Wars Universe podcast. Um, and I know we'll have, probably have a little rivalry between you guys and, and us about uh, uh, Star Wars and Star Trek and, and, and how the two shows approach ethical questions. Um, but, but staying just on this, on Star Trek, let, let's shift now into the, um, the conversation specifically about Picard, because I know one of the reasons why I was so excited to bring you on was... We are about to get new Star Trek content for the first time in a little while, and you and I have talked a lot about the idea that one reason we liked the TV show The Orville so much is that, you know, whatever we thought about the J.J. Abrams movies and the Star Trek Discovery show, they weren't quite scratching the Star Trek itch in the way that we wanted, and that Orville kind of was in some ways. And and so I was really excited to look at this new Picard show that's coming out, and to really wonder, what if this is going to get us back to the kind of stuff we loved about Star Trek, including, like you just said, like all that moral gray area, the, the, the episodes where you can watch it and two people can have different understandings of what happened or what should have happened. Um, so, so kind of with that in mind, let's just start on the general level. What, what has you excited about the, the Picard TV show? Uh, well, I, I, it's hard to say. Because a lot of a lot of what has me excited about the Picard series has absolutely nothing to do with what I want out of Star Trek, really. Mm, okay. Um. So so like, stepping back, like uh, the, the whole reason we're naming uh, our thing Stranded Panda is because I feel like a stranded panda. That's the whole. That's the whole thing. Is that uh, there's this idea of being a geek, and back in the day sci-fi and fantasy was used at least at its height so like the popular stuff the stuff that people loved like star trek uh like lord of the rings uh like all of it and and, and even even star wars i guess um <laughs> it th- th- they was used to tell a story that was hard to tell in today's settings like yeah it is being used to pu- you're putting that skin on it so that you can tell the story like you were talking about with that episode about the people with the 
white and black faces. Like that's you being used to tell a story about racism in a weird way. So kids can like get into it where it's not just about race. It's about these weird aliens, you know, it's a, right. Uh, it, it's, it's genre fiction at some point was used at used for that purpose. And as genre fiction has become pop culture, as it has become the main culture, <laughs> as Marvel and Star Wars and everything has become the most popular things in the world, we're getting a lot of people just copying the skin of the thing without caring what's underlying it. Yeah. And so I feel like a sort of rare breed at this point. Like, I feel like there's a lot of people who just want to go see fantasy things because they have wizards in them and they just want to see sci-fi things because they have lasers. And I would like... I love sci-fi and lasers. It makes me feel comfortable. It's what I it's what I grew up around. But I want my sci-fi to have a purpose and and be trying to say something. And I know obviously with the superhero ethics podcast, that's something you guys care about too. Very um, much so. And and so the, the the sad part is the only reason I'm more excited for Picard. Oh, okay, to, th- there are two levels to this. The main reason I'm more excited for Picard than, say, Discovery, which I don't hate Discovery. I like Discovery. But um, they're getting back to just what I want to see out of my Star Trek. Well, for one thing, there's familiar characters. I mean, Mm -hmm. getting to see where Picard is. uh, Picard, Riker, Troy. And I'm hoping we get – and Data. We at least see him in a dream sequence. Uh, I'm hoping we get LaForge. I'm hoping we get Q. I'm hoping – and we know we get Seven of Nine. Seeing all these classic characters and seeing what's happened over the 30 years, that's just exciting to me. And it has nothing to do with my stranded panda ethos. That's just <laughs> me as a geek being like, oh, yeah, man. Fan service has a point. It's total fan service, and I'm so pumped. This, this show is fan service in a way that is exciting me. But uh-huh. the thing that does give me hope in my whole stranded panda ethos is... Is ethos the word I'm looking for? I think it's okay. Yeah, ethos is. Uh, <laughs> it is the fact that the the episodes they are focusing on it seems based on the trailers the uh-huh. the storylines they're expounding on are some of the media storylines in Star Trek Next Generation uh, yeah. the, the the story of data becoming uh, having rights and the story of a, a a future race of synthetic beings having rights that apparently exists in this world. That's a huge, one of the best episodes of Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek me- uh, t- t- Next Generation Measure of a Man is one of my favorite mm-hmm. episodes. It is the one that sparked me writing this entire album because I wrote an, I wrote one about Measure of a Man that I loved, and I was like, why don't I do that some more? Um, it, it's such a great episode. It's just really digging down on like, what's the diff- why, why do we Why is data property? What's the difference between data and you? And... And that's it's it's just a great episode. It's do it's Star Trek doing what it does best, yeah, um, and does better than maybe anyone else does that thing. I don't know any mm-hmm. other show that can have a courtroom drama in space. If you're in any other show, almost any other show that's genre is going to have a laser go off at some point. Yeah, that episode of uh, TNG Measure of Man is just them sitting in a courtroom. You've got androids, you've got phasers, you've got starships all around. But that episode is not about any of that. That episode is about a about a a a, a race of people that is being treat mistreated because they're not being understood. Yeah, and that's well, all it is. It's just a conversation. The whole thing is just conversations, and I love that. And, and I'm with you there, and that's why I, sh- I actually do think that um. It sounded like you started by saying that what you're excited about for Picard isn't necessarily why you're normally excited for Star Trek, but with that last point, it sounds like it is to some extent, and certainly oh, yes. I know it is for me. Sorry, like, I, I was making the two points. The first one being that it's, oh, okay, I'm yeah. just excited about seeing all my old friends again. The mm-hmm. second point being I the, the specific storylines they are choosing. The Borg and Hugh specifically um, – the character of Hugh, who is the Borg, yep. who was, was disconnected, and then Picard had to learn to get over his hatred of the Borg, which that so, so that he could see the individual, and that's that's what all this is about. Like so much of Star Trek is about getting past your preconceptions of what a person is, what life is, um, and and seeing a seeing a being on the other side with rights and with a life like yours. And trying, or unlike yours, and trying to understand them, and trying to give them 
a fair shake and give them weight in your decision making. Like I it just, it's so good, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely with you. And it's funny as you're talking about that, I was thinking about how some of my favorite MCU uh, Marvel Universe things have either been like that, or I wish they were. You know, like yeah. the wonderful ending of Doctor Strange, where he doesn't use violence to beat the enemy, but he actually like logics out uh, Dormammu. Yeah. To me, that felt like an incredibly Star Trek kind of scene, you know? Oh, for sure. Um, oh, man. It's, and like, it's so much like Kirk using his wits to outwit yeah. the bad guy instead of just firing better torpedoes, which is what happens on so much bad sci-fi. <laughs> you just, oh, we finally perfected the techno babble torpedoes. Fire those. We win. <laughs> yeah. And, like, I've, I've joked a couple times that although I think the fight scenes in Marvel Civil War are fantastic— there's a part of me that would have really loved Marvel Civil War, the bureaucratic wrangling, you know, that was just Captain America and Tony Stark trying to, like, say, okay, the Treaty of Segovia sucks, but we need something. Let's find it better. And then if someone gets prosecuted for it, we'll get Matt Murdock in to do a courtroom scene. And, like, I would love that. They'll never do it because they want the big fight scenes. But right. But you're right. And that's – I think it's part of what makes Star Trek unique. And it is it is certainly why I'm so excited for Picard because – I don't think we're going to go back to the Roddenberry days of, of DS9 and Voyager and Next Generation. And, and in some ways, I think that's good. Um, I like those shows, but there's a campiness and a this isn't realness that um, – I, like, I remember the first time I watched Battlestar Galactica, I was blown away because it was people having real emotions in space. Yeah. And I remember the first time was, like, when two people hooked up – and it really was, like, the characters got horny, they went to bed, they felt awkward the next day, and then they moved on. <laughs> Star Trek, that would, like, those those 90s Star Trek shows, e- you kissed someone, and that meant you were falling in love. Like, that was the only way to do it. I would I would say DS9 gets a lot closer to what you're talking about. What, and you know, that's, that's the true. same that's the same guy. Ronald D. Moore yeah. was the showrunner for both uh ds9 and battlestar so that's yeah. the connection there he he was and he was always pushing for that to- type of storytelling and rick berman was always pushing back against it because he wanted it to be like old <laughs> star trek and so i, I think Ronald D. moore is one of the big heroes of the modern age of star trek like i of course that's yeah. my perspective as someone who loves ds9 there's a lot of voyager lovers out there who are like no it- ds9 is not star trek <laughs> It, it, it's funny. I, I admit I have a deep love of Voyager, but I think I watched most of Voyager on a binge after I had um, had major surgery on my leg. So it might be that I was on morphine for most of the time I watched Voyager, and that yeah. might have affected my memories. I've been rewatching it for this, uh, getting ready for Picard, and uh-huh. there are moments I get really excited. There are moments that make me tear up, and especially when you're picking and choosing and only watching sort of the best episodes. Yeah, uh, but almost every episode there's some glaring problem where i'm like this yeah. is so sloppily written and i and, and that's not even my biggest problem with voyager but like just on my rewatch i'm like man i i get really frustrated with content that doesn't care just yeah. to, like, like whoever's writing it doesn't care there we just we just covered runaways have, have you mm-hmm. have you have you listened to our cast on runaways i haven't no and i, I loved the first two seasons and i'm i'm, I'm curious slash nervous about this one so In yeah se- I, I am planning the to. final episode of season three which i won't spoil who or why or what uh but they it's so sloppily written that one of the characters dies twice yeah like Oof. they die and then a few scenes later, they die again and oh my God. <laughs> a, in a different way. And you go, wait, didn't that just happen over? Th- what? What? And yeah. like, I was just like, you're being paid millions and millions of dollars to write and make this thing. And I just feel like I care more about what I'm doing and making zero dollars than you care about. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it just really frustrates me. Well, and just pulling us back to this, but the original point I was making was, it, it's part. I, I do hope that Picard is going to be a little bit more of a kind of a modern show with some modern sensibilities, but especially after, like I I I've heard that Discovery gets closer to Star Trek, and I'm excited to see that. Um, but certainly the J.J. Abrams stuff that really felt like when you talked about how some people think science fiction is just you know pew pew robots and lasers and aliens, yeah. like that's absolutely J.J. Abrams Star Trek. Like he does not. 
I don't have any sense in those movies of the Roddenberry deep ethical exploration. Um, Unfortunately, you're right. I think the third one, Beyond, which I think J.J. had very little to do with, I think um, uh-huh. Simon Pegg wrote it, and he is much more of a classic Star Trek fan. And I think the, like, that's the thing. J.J. Abrams is a Star Wars fan. He's not a Star Wars Trek fan. And so when he got Star Trek, he was like, close enough, and he just kind of made it into Star Wars yeah. and made it a lot more about the action and the, the, the they literally gave someone a lightsaber in the first one. Um, yeah. Sulu has like a expandable sword and I'm like, really? <laughs> really? Well, and, and it's funny because I know, and again, this is a, a conversation for more of another time, but you, you tend to not see Star Wars as terribly ethically deep in the same way and that Star Wars is more pew pew explosions. And I, and I think there's some truth to that, but I definitely think that like when you say Abrams is a Star Wars fan, I bristle because on a fundamental level, I feel like J.J. Abrams does not get Star Wars because I, I, I do that think- may be. That may yeah. be. I, I think he doesn't get the kind of Star Wars you want, right? Uh, clearly, based on this last trilogy. But like, I, I think that he. I don't think there was any depth, much much depth to this most recent trilogy, and I. And I yeah. and it, it it just bothers me. So anyway, getting us back to the the topic though, uh, let let's let's talk about what we know about Picard um, from the trailers and kind of some of the like you've talked a little bit about it, but. I know you've gone pretty in depth with it. Do you want to kind of just highlight what are three of the four? What are a couple of like things that we've seen are going to be explored in the plot, and then we can talk about kind of how we think about some of the ethical questions that the show's going to explore. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think the basic. Okay, and I don't know how spoilery this is. Uh, this may be a little spoilery. It's not because it's in released content. But have you seen the most recent short trek? <laughs> I have not. Uh, so, uh, based on the trailer for Picard. Uh, one of the biggest things, I mentioned it earlier, Measure of a Man, you have this episode of Star Trek where Data is on trial. And the, they, they basically resolve that episode by saying, we can't say that Data is not a person. We can't infringe on his rights because one day we're going to make more Datas. And right. if we do, that's going to become a race. And it's going to become a class of people that... Uh, we're going to have to like decide whether we're going to protect those people or we're going to you know enslave those people, and are they people? And and they basically at the end of that episode say we we can't make a decision now. Really, we we don't really have an answer to that. Uh, but I, I'm not I'm not ready to enslave data for the purposes of the fact that it might cause might set a precedent for later. Right. They don't really give them a lot of rights, but they. Uh, they, they, do, they don't want to set the precedent. Well, in the trailer for the new Picard series, there is a shot of soon, soon like androids in a closet. Yeah. A big door opens, big bay door, and they're just in a closet standing there. They look like they're just obviously like just servants. Um, and it just, it's exactly this great episode of Star Trek. And, and all these moral, moral questions, they clearly did not work out. So in the last 30 years, they've learned to replicate the soon androids, and they are uh, completely enslaving them. And that, yeah. uh, it, that, that, the fact that that's probably a big part of it, and I, I, I thought it was a big part of it, but then this most recent short trek, mm-hmm. very exciting to me had uh, a battle sequence. You may have seen it in the trailer. In the battle sequence in the trailer, you see Picard have flashes of a battle that he's having a bad memory of. Do you remember that in the trailer? I do, yeah. <clears throat> well, that they show that battle in uh, the new short trek. Interesting. Just they, they show a clip of it on the news. There's two little girls watching the news, and their parents are on Mars. And the two little okay. girls look up, and they see this battle and it's the exact shots from Picard and wow. And, and, and so it's that battle and it says at the bottom of the screen in very small letters. So it's almost an Easter egg. That's why I say, so skip 30 seconds ahead. If you don't want to be spoiled for this, it's, I don't think it's a spoiler cause it's on the screen, but whatever it says on the bottom rogue synths attack Mars 3000 dead. Oh, wow. So, we're getting a world where not only are these being enslaved and Picard wants to save them from slavery, but they have gone rogue, some rogue synths. And I'm assuming that synths means synthetic. It's synthetic people, yeah. yeah. That's what I'm guessing, too. And, and rogue meaning they've been enslaved up to this point, and they are pushing back, and they're fighting for their rights. So we're not just getting 
uh, we're not getting, I'm getting like goosebumps talk, thinking about this, but we're yeah. not just getting, uh, we want to help these, help these enslaved peoples. We're getting like an already in, in progress, like revolution that yeah. we're going to have to like somehow deal with. I am so excited for that storyline. That, that sounds really great. And especially because I've always thought artificial intelligence, especially in the like the eighties and beyond era is one of the issues that Star Trek has really explored so well. Um, all of the data stories, I think we, uh, Superhero Ethics actually already did an episode on Measure of a Man because it is just such an ethically rich question. That it, it gets into everything about the nature of life and the nature of sentience and what does it mean for, for one being to create another being. Like there's all sorts of stuff about parenting and, and autonomy. Um, but also, you know, I, I agree with you. I think Voyager is the weakest of the series. But if there's one thing I thought Voyager explored that was really interesting, even if they stumbled with it sometimes, they also did their version of artificial intelligence with the Doctor, a holographic life form. Absolutely. And I and I think yeah that that I I'm going to be really excited to see how they pick up on that, um, especially because it's interesting. You and I kind of talk about all the different like Star Trek adjacent television that there's been out there. We obviously talk about the Orville. We were earlier talking about Battlestar Galactica. Um, another of my favorite Star Trek adjacent shows, especially because it is very anti Rod and Mary in a way, um, is Babylon 5, which I think is some of the best television I've ever seen, especially if you really love continuity, because he literally had the entire story written the day he wrote episode one. Mm-hmm. Um, it also is some of the cheesiest, worst special effects, and sometimes, mm-hmm. especially in season one, bad acting I've ever seen. Um, but the reason I bring it up is uh, a fundamental plot line there is the emergence of um, psychics, and then the the fear about the role psychics will play in our society to the point where psychics attacking Mars specifically becomes like a big thing in the show. Oh, funny. Of, uh, um, and, and Mars is, 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 it's a kind of a different thing, but there's a lot of conflict on Mars, especially, but, but it, it, I definitely got a, a hint of that in the way you described it. They may have had no idea of that when they were writing that scene, but certainly it's, um, like one of the things I liked about Babylon 5 is Babylon 5 did the opposite of Star Trek. It said, what if we're 500 years in the future, but all the same problems are still there? There still is hunger. There still is religion. There still is a news media. Yeah. There still is all the things Rod and Mary thought would go away. Um, and so to hear about like the news, we've never seen the news on Star Trek before. That's true. And that, that um, actually really interests me. It, it actually shows a picture of Picard, and it says uh, – Pic- Admiral Picard says uh, – comments on th- rogue synths attacking Mars, and it just says, in quotations, devastated. Wow. And so it's just and, – and I'm, I'm guessing that's what sends him to his uh, vineyard, is that he was probably fighting for the rights of these these synths and, and trying to probably keep the peace and, and fight for their rights, and then they ended up, like, you know, not being able to get rights and ended up attacking, which, man – Oh, it's it's just. Can you think about that? Think about data. Think about someone. You know his his affection for data. If data yeah. had had like not been able to get his rights in Measure of Man, and then had gone violent and attacked. Well, and it's um, I, my, forgive me. My brain is going off on tangents, everyone. So I apologize to our fans. <laughs> but um, the the first thing that I think of is that I've seen Patrick Stewart do that before, because I've seen Professor X when the mutants he so wants to raise and show society are good and are not scary. That's true. Some of them start rebel. Like, it, like, like there's such a parallel there, isn't there? Absolutely. Yeah. So it, it, all this is just making me so much more excited to see. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm really curious to see where that's going to go. And it, it, let me ask you this, especially as someone who loves the continuity data was always clearly one of our favorite characters. I think one of your favorite characters, um, and it, it's interesting that it looks like Brent Spiner is going to be involved in some extent. Um, there's going to be like dream sequences or, or, or kind of mental imaginings where um, Data is talking to Picard. Right. So my question for you is, how do you feel, though, as someone who both loves the character of Data but also loves continuity? Like, is it important that Data is canonically dead and stays dead? Or if they did some kind of technology hand-waving of Data being rebuilt – 
is that something you'd be excited for? Um, I wouldn't mind it. He's canonically dead, but in the worst Star Trek movie. Um, yeah, and, <laughs> also true. And they did it in a ham-fisted way, and they clearly... When Spock died, he grabbed the face of McCoy and put his Katra into McCoy. When, right. right before Data dies, he downloads his full consciousness into B4. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. And so, and there's actually, in, in the Countdown comics to the 2009 Star Trek, uh-huh. uh, there's actually a, a Captain Data uh, in, in the fleet, and... It's never explained why there's a Captain Data, but you can just assume that uh, B4 uh, became Data after Data died because right. he had his full consciousness downloaded into him. Which, by the <clears throat> way, is one of the worst scenes in Star Trek for, 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 for this question because they have this conversation, and it's, it's so ham-fisted. I just watched this movie, had read, a, had read a song about it, actually really liked the song, and I tried to focus on the things that I liked in it but this scene is like unforgivable for the data storyline because data is oh, no. all yeah i know you, you go back and watch it you're gonna hate it so much uh <laughs> data meets this is B- the tv equivalent of this smells so bad smell this yes exactly <laughs> it, data goes meets b4 and he and b4 is a different a different android and then he decides to he he him and Jordy have this really short conversation about, and Jordy's like, uh, "Why are you down? Da- I can't believe Picard let you do this. I can't believe the captain let you download your entire consciousness into it's all of your memories. This is all of who you are into B four." And he's like, "Well, I want him to have all the advantages that I have." And he's like, "Yes, but he's a different being. Like maybe he has his own experiences, and he'll grow his own direction." And 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 Data's like, yes, but I want to give him all the like da 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 whatever, all the possibilities that I can. And then he just gives him his consciousness. He overwrites this poor B four oh, before b- before he has a chance to grow into something like Data uh, and have his own make his own choices. Uh, and and now in by the end of the episode, at the end of the movie, there's 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 a there's this scene at the very end where he's hauntingly singing a song that Mm -hmm. data was singing at the beginning and so it's it's clear from that that he's already his consciousness is emerging in b4 and then you have the comic book where you have this captain data which those comic books are were written by the same guy i think it's kurtzman who is writing the picard series so if there's a captain data out there in the comics there's very likely a captain data out there in this picard universe Um, Uh and it's probably b4 which is that that scene is so unforgivable when you get this entire series about data trying to become a person, make his own decisions, and then he meets another android like himself and then just takes away his agency. <laughs> yeah, that does not seem to fit. No. Um, just on that similar subject, do we know canonically what has happened to Lore, data's kind of evil twin? Uh, he was uh, decommissioned after descent. Uh, he okay. he met so Hugh, the character who's also in the new Picard series, who I'm super excited about. Um, Hugh is a character. He was a Borg who they found disconnected from the hive, and they teach him how to be an individual. And by the end, it's one of my favorite. One, of, it's another one of my favorite episodes. By the end of uh, this, this episode is called "I Borg," and Picard hates the Borg because of what they did to him. But Picard is looking at Hugh and saying. Uh, he actually tries to convince Hugh. He becomes. He takes on his Locutus persona, uh-huh. and he tries to convince Hugh to help him assimilate the Enterprise. Mm-hmm. And Hughes goes, "No, they don't want to be assimilated." Right. And he's like, "Jordy doesn't want to be assimilated, and Jordy is my friend. I won't help you." And he and he's and then and then Picard is taken aback because the Borg uses for the first time he uses the pronoun "I." And he's like, mm-hmm. "You're not. You're not an I. You are. A, you are Borg. We are Borg." And he's like, "No, I. I will not help you." And 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 like he stands up for his his new friends on the Enterprise and won't won't assimilate them. And it's just such a beautiful picture of Picard learning to believe in the individuality of even a Borg and the possibility that life can uh, exist even there. And it's just a great episode. Another great episode. So that character is going to be on Picard as well. 
uh, and I kind of forgot what I was getting. Sorry, where I was going with all that. I got into the cyborg. I, I think you just did the perfect segue. If you didn't mean it, because we we were talking before about how the other big issue that we're both really excited to see how they explore on this show is the Borg, and is yeah. by all indications, it seems like. Maybe the Borg are still an enemy, but maybe they're kind of now more like almost refugees. Now it's sort of a situation of like, can you learn to stop hating your enemy when they're a different and they're in a different situation? And I, I, my impression is that all these same questions about what is the nat- like, I think the questions that surround the Borg are going to really dovetail into the questions that surround data and androids because it's the same kind of thing of, what is the value of individual, you know, of who has rights, who has individualism, who has, you know, an individual robot being treated as a sentient living being with rights in the same way of like an individual part of what was a collective. And like, how do you deal with that? And how do you, one of my favorite topics is always the idea of what moral value do you give to your enemies, you know, and I love characters like Daredevil, for example, who really wrestle with, you know, it's not just nameless, faceless enemies who I'm fighting, in, in, unless it's zombie ninjas in season two. But, like, other than that, it's it's the people I'm fighting have a face. They have an identity. They are individuals. I can't just say they are bad people. Yeah. And that's what that's what Hugh teaches Picard, is that you can't just believe that um, – the Borg are all just like, quote unquote, bad people. They are individuals somewhere under all of that. And, and, um, you know, they can become individuals. They can become redeemable. Right. And in the same way, like, you know, I imagine if we're going to get stories about, is this just a bunch of machines that we're fighting and kind of like a a matrix or Terminator idea that some people see this sense as just a bunch of misprogrammed machines that have to be destroyed instead of, a bunch of individuals who have legitimate concerns and fears and maybe their their means of expressing their their political concern isn't one you disagree with but it doesn't mean that it's just a malfunction it's they have rights they're being abused and yeah I, i'm just really excited to see how all of those things kind of play together and play out yeah something that hit me as i was wa- i was i was writing all these songs uh about um about Star Trek is I was trying to write all these songs about the Borg and trying to connect them to my own experience and having the way Hugh talks about the Borg and he doesn't talk about them as people that wronged him. Uh He talks about them as a family that he wants to get back to and a sort of like belief system that they have that everything will eventually come up Borg as it were yeah. It actually really started to remind me a lot of religion. Yeah, I think and that's true. And I don't think they very distinctly draw that parallel on the show, but na- once I saw it, I can't unsee it. I-, I feel like the Borg are very strongly related, just the way they want to change everyone to what they are, and they don't see themselves as wanting to conquer. They see themselves as wanting to help everyone. They want everyone to see- achieve peace and unity. Yeah. And and so it's the Borg are a really interesting look at religion from the outside. I think I and that really helped me get to where I was writing these songs. And that and I, I don't know. It, it it I can't unsee it. It's weird. No, it it's a great connection. I, know, I I I think I've talked with you about this. I know I've talked about it on other podcasts. Um, as a student of religion, something I've always been fascinated by is the extent to which like most of the kind of like you know quote unquote great religious leaders of our time. You know, Abraham, Jesus, Mohammed, Buddha, John Wesley, Dorothy Day, like whoever it is, almost all the time these people come along and say, at least according to the stories, whether you you believe they're real or not, but they come along and say, hey, all of you people, you started all thinking the same way and making the same mistakes. I want to challenge you to think as individuals and to be your own people and to try and question the things around you. And then what almost always happens is that people start saying, oh, well, that, that person told us to think this way, so let's all just think that way and not have to think. And it's, um, mm-hmm. I think there's something incredibly comforting about having someone just tell you what to think and tell you what is right. Um, I, I, you're, I, you may know the exact wording better than I do, but when, when in, um, the first Avengers movie and Loki 
kind of comes like to to claim his role as the the emperor of earth or whatever and he says that he comes to offer i think the wording is freedom from choice um mm. it, it it's something like that but it's it's presented as this kind of mustache twirling idea but it's something that really appeals to some people they don't want to have to think about morality they don't want to have to think about right and wrong they want some powerful person to stand up and say these people are good. These people are bad. Do this and hate that. And it's all very simple. Um, and I think that's why the, those kind of religious devotion, like, that really appeals to people um, in really scary ways. And, and what I'm going to is, I, I, I never made this connection before, but I think you're right. That's a big thing the Borg does, is if you're plugged into the Borg, you don't have to worry about who likes you and who doesn't, because you can read everyone's thoughts. You don't have to worry about... You know, should you make steak for dinner or make chicken? Like, everything is already taken care of. Yeah. Um, and I I love the, the song that you wrote. We're going to have some links to the, to your songs at the end of this episode and on the, um, the show that. notes. Thanks. I, I think my favorite of yours so far is that one you wrote about Hugh. And it's there's that one line that moves me so much. Um, and you can, you can quote the exact lyric because I'm probably getting it wrong. But it's, it's something about, like, I'm no longer a we, I'm now an I. Oh yeah, um, uh, along came the Enterprise, and my wee's turned to eyes. Yeah, it's a little cheesy, like, but uh, <laughs> I, it, I, I, maybe I'm a cheesy guy. I, no, no, I no, had no. goosebumps again. Just oh, thinking I'm sorry. About it. Like, I definitely did not mean to uh, shame you for liking one of my lyrics. I promise. <laughs> yeah, but I, I it, whenever I state my own lyrics, I always feel like I'm embarrassed by them. Uh, but yeah, and then particularly that one. That one's such a, it's such a funny because I wrote a rap song about Hugh, and that's fun to me. Yeah, my, the line that really gets me still uh, when I sing that, and and the line that gets me is um. There's a limit to my processing power. I can't be sure what might happen this next hour. And mm-hmm. like that's about the the idea that the Borg believe fully that resistance is futile. Eventually the entire universe will be the Borg. Everything's yeah. eventually going to come up Borg like uh and that's the way most religions are too. Uh they all believe that eventually if you do what you're supposed to do according to this book that you have you're going to you're going to ha- you think good things are going to come to you whether it's in the afterlife and then eventually whatever your god will come back and the rest of the world will know that you're you were right and so the borg yeah. have this because they all work together they believe so strongly that they they know they know the future and and that line in my song is 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 about myself standing outside religion and it's about Hugh standing outside the collective this limit to my processing power. I can't be sure what might happen this next hour. And like, that's, that's, that makes you anxious because you don't know the future anymore. If you're, if you're such a believer in a religion, you, you believe, you know how things end. And that's, uh, that, that's really meaningful to me. I I think, um, this is something you and I talked about on one of our Orville podcast episodes where we talked about how, like, and and this is something I, I always, Gene Roddenberry obviously was very, very atheist and very, very much like, science good, religion bad, which is a dichotomy that I never quite believe in, but but that I do think that one of the things that, that Star Trek didn't identify enough, and that, um, as we talked on Orville, sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't, but it's that idea of, like, even if you can prove to someone that their religion is wrong, um, or at least that their approach to religion is, is fundamentalist and, like, isn't, that their scientific facts are wrong, you have to account for the fact that you're taking away like the fundamental thing they've based their life on, you know, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, like giving you just an example, like um, in my biblical studies courses in seminary, uh, you know, we had a, a biblical history professor who went on a long uh, explanation and, and spoilers, I, if you're a, a biblically fundamentalist, you may not like what I'm about to say, uh, or maybe uh, skip ahead 30 seconds, but they basically went through the history and like proved that there is absolutely no evidence that the Jewish people were ever in Egypt or ever had anything to do with the building of the pyramids. Um, there's actually very solid evidence that, like, different Israelite peoples living in the, the Jordan River Valley, like, one of them used to enslave another, and there's a story about that rebellion, but then when they were bringing all those people together to unify them, they didn't want to make it a story of, like, one half of us were doing shitty things to another, so they said, well, let's just make it about Egypt. Um, and And... What I loved was that the professor was was training us to be pastors, and the professor both explained all of that, but then also said, remember, 
you can't stand up in a pulpit and talk to people who have spent 50 years of their life believing this is true and just say, nope, haha, it's all false. You know, like there's a lot of pain that goes along with that. Um, and this is all a very long tangent. Um, but, but kind of what I'm getting to is it, it, I, I think what it gets to is the idea that like, if a fundamental ethos of Star Trek is to find the ignorant and bring them enlightenment and to show the people who think that, you know, the the world is governed by uh, mystical forces that are just the the tides. Let's let's teach them the science. But that what I think Star Trek always missed was the reminder that taking that away from someone is painful, and there has to be some accommodation for it. And I I love that in the character of Hugh, I feel like that's the one place where they get it. You know, where there is a sense of like it's probably better to not be locked in that collective, but it's also going to suck if that's what you got used to. Yeah. And that's what's so great. Hugh appears on three episodes, two of them being a two-parter. And uh-huh. the second time he comes back, it's so it's so neat. They they send him back into the hive. He de- he ch- they actually don't send him back to the hive. They give him a choice and he says it would be more dangerous if I stay. It'll be dangerous for Jordy, it'll be dangerous for my new friends if I stay because the Borg will come for me. Uh, thank you for offering me sanctuary, but I'm going to go back to the hive, even if it means me losing my individuality that I now cherish. And, right. uh, and they send him back, but his his individuality is spread through the collective. And then the next episode he appears on, um, that's the one I was talking about with Lore. That's where I was going earlier when I was talking about oh, Okay, Hugh. We, we got all the way around. Finally got around to it. Uh, that's where the last episode we see Lore in. Lore has met up with a group of individual Borg who have disconnected from the hive and they're now an individual Uh, they're now a group of individuals and but they are so um desperate for a voice to cling to that they follow lore because they need they need leadership they don't they don't want to be alone they don't like the the not having so they 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 trust they call they call lore the one Um, right and he becomes their sort of voice that they follow and and that's uh, and it's it's just such such a great episode. But at the end of that, they end up dismantling lore. That was my answer to your question earlier. I know oh, that's it took right. Me, okay. I know it took me like twenty five minutes to get there. But that was the <laughs> answer. Uh, but when Hugh comes back, it's really interesting because you know you'd think they they saved him from the Borg, they gave him his individuality. But when he comes back, he's like living in caves and he's being mistreated by lore, and lore is experimenting on them and stuff, and like, and he is just really broken hearted because he has his individuality he can't really go back he doesn't want to be a borg uh drone but he also hates the life of not having anything to believe in basically yeah. and not not having a, the voices in his head give him the life he had before I, it's such a such a beautiful episode and such a poignant look at what exactly what we're talking about so i hope they explore that more i hope that the borg conversation um is 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 in that realm, I guess. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely excited and I'm, um, I'll admit I'm a little nervous, especially because like, yes, I think this is going to be more of a modern sensibilities kind of a TV show and that that's going to be good in some ways. But I also know like a lot of the preview is about the conflict that's happening and these, these scenes of starships attacking. And I, I'm a little nervous about, um, you know, it, it, this show going a little bit more of the um, pew pew explosion and not just the ethical exploration. Um, yeah. But I, the, the topics they're setting up are so deep and so rich. I really think we're going to get a lot out of it. I think um, so too. I really do. I, I, I always say this. I'm not, I have no problem with action sequences. Like I love yeah. a good action sequence, but an action sequence that does not have anything behind it, that hasn't set up a character that I care about, that I don't feel a real risk and that I, there's no moral like moral thing happening in the background of that, that fight sequence. Like I, I'm, I just lose interest. I, and I yeah. love a fight scene if it has the proper context. So the fact that it has showing a lot of action, I don't mind. Uh, yeah. it's, it's that it's that they need to back that up. And so far it seems like they are with these rogue synths and with the Borg, um, with seven of nine working with Hugh and fighting to it looks like to free more Borg, like that all just seems really uh, r- like it could have exactly the kind of things we want in it. 
I, I think it's right. I think it, um, you were talking earlier about like the problems you have with lazy writing. And I, th- I think that's what it comes down to a lot is I think it's very easy for a show or a movie to get into a place of we've written ourselves in a kind of an ethical corner. We don't know how these characters would, would act. Let's just have them fight. Um, Absolutely. Or, or even worse, hey, we have this fun idea for a fight scene. Let's write a story that kind of sort of justifies why they're fighting. Or even um, worse than that. It's the it's the thirty eight minute mark of the television show. Who are we going to have him fight this week? <laughs> right, <laughs> which is so common with certain superhero media. Yeah, no, it's definitely true, and I think that that's like some of the stuff that I love. Like, um, you know, the ones that I love, it tends to be where yeah, there's some great fight scenes, um, but they, they're for a reason. You know, they yeah. don't just happen just to have a fight scene. And I think, I, I think you're right. I, I hope that's what this is going to be. Um, and I'd certainly be excited for that. Um, uh, I, I, let me, uh, we've been going for a while and I don't want to keep either of us too late. Um, but to close out, let me ask kind of the last big question, which is, um, it, it seems from the trailers that we have a little bit of evidence that the Federation is not quite the happy go lucky. Everything is wonderful that it was in, uh, some of the early Star Trek. Like it's, it's clearly even by DS9 isn't quite that already, but we have at least one really great scene of, Picard basically saying like that that he thinks the Federation has lost its way that it's not what it should be and Federation officers telling him like Picard you're not welcome anymore this isn't your Federation anymore um what what do you think is wh- where do you think we're going with the Federation and and what 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 would you like to see explored in terms of the questions about that hmm well I, I there are two hats I can put on where do I think we're going because of knowledge I have from other content and discovery and such. And what do I want out of this particular show? So I'll try to stick to that one because I, uh, there's some interesting stuff in discovery. We can get into at the end if you want. Uh, uh-huh. I want them to allow conflict, you know, that's, and they are, they just yeah. straight up are they Picard standing on that Admiral's desk and saying, this is what the Federation stands for. This is what it should still stand for. I can't imagine that line being in a show that isn't going to have some like serious moral questions. Now, what I would like to see is that Admiral having a fair point. I really yes. hope we don't just get mustache twirly admirals who want to do bad things because it'd be really easy to be on the side of the synths. If, if, if that's what we're going with, if like we're they're exterminating a bunch of synthetics because of the, the, the revolution that's starting. And then, you know, Picard's trying to defend them. Yeah. Uh, then, and that's, that, that seems like a pretty solid way we could go. Or like, who knows? Maybe there, maybe that synthetic fleet that just killed 3000 on Mars is like going after or like, or trying to escape and the Federation's hunting them down, like, uh, or something like that, you know, and, and Picard's trying to stop them or save them or whatever. Um, I just, I just hope that whatever they do, it's not so mustache twirly. Because honestly, just seeing that, like these people just attacked us, and this is very touching our world right now. Like, oh um, yeah, you know, it's it's nine eleven, man. <laughs> like, it's it's straight up nine eleven. It's, it's a bunch of people died on this day with an attack, and and now we're going to use the full might of the Federation to go attack them back where they are, and 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 you know causes a, a like cycle of war that continues and you know the the people that want to fight back when they're attacked aren't wrong necessarily yeah and that's what i want to see i, I guess is is my answer <laughs> i i mean that that it's a top it's an issue that i think is always so interesting to explore the kind of uh the professor x versus magneto or black panther versus killmonger kind of questions of what do you do when your group is being oppressed, and now part of your group thinks the way to respond is to fight back. Um, and maybe they have some points, and maybe they're uh, a little bit too over the, so- the edge, or maybe they're not. Um, I'm, I'm also especially interested in, um, and part of this, again, it's kind of challenging Rod Mary, but it's also just a good question, is they make such a big deal about the idea that the Federation is not a military, at least in the original series and the, and the TNG. It is a scientific, uh, you know, exploratory organization that has the ability to have conflict and combat when it needs to. 
But, you know, the Enterprise isn't a battleship. It's not Battlestar Galactica. It's a, um, you know, it's an exploratory science vehicle, uh, vessel. Towards the end of DS9, we get the impression, we, we, it, it's pretty explicitly said that the Federation is now shifting to be more of a military organization. The, the war with the Dominion and the war with the Borg, like, we're getting the idea of, like, what happens when for six months or a year, the Federation has a military focus. Yeah. What I'm hoping is that part of the show is saying, what if it's 30 years later and they haven't let go of the military stuff? Um, yeah. That's and that's exactly what you're question. saying about 9-11. You know, it's 20 years after 9-11 and we're still fighting. We're still on the war footing. Like, oh, that would be, that'd be such a good question for them to yeah. explore. That's a great and, and there's so many aspects of that you could tackle. And right. it seems like that's at least partially what they're doing. Um now we don't know that the the Dominion War ended and we don't know that the Bo- Voyager ended with the Borg um supposedly sort of at least uh incapacitated. Um, right. Now we don't know how extensively they were incapacitated. Um some people think the Borg were literally defeated at the end of Voyager, uh, or it could have just been that their one of their nodes were destroyed or whatever, one of their transwarp nodes. Uh, but, yeah, I, I don't know if it's possible they've been at war that long, but it is definitely possible that they've been on a uh, war footing, as you say. Right. And 30 years, it seems like that's almost time, especially with all the new technologies they were developing. They probably could have almost explored the full galaxy by now. And, like, what happens to that huge behemoth organization when everything's explored yeah that that's I, i'm just thinking of that but like it, toward the end of the show they're starting to get transport capabilities and things on voyager and it's like oh if you could do all this transwarp stuff you can get anywhere in the galaxy pretty quickly what if they just finished exploring it and like what do they do with this what do they do with the federation when it's just spread all over everywhere that's reachable you know I, I mean, there's some great historical essays that were written, like, at the end of the 1800s that were about the entire American spirit has been, like, slowly colonizing the continent until we get to the coast. And what happens now that we have the whole continent? And certainly mm. you can say a lot of the 20th century, like, American problems were we kind of trying to figure out where to go next and, and, and not ability to just stop trying to take over everything and it also has some like economic implications uh, to current day a lot of our economics in america particularly is based on growth uh all of our corporations have to have a certain percentage of growth every year or they yep or the and, and and that causes uh certain problems because not all corporations should grow 15 percent every year like it just shouldn't that's not the way that the economy should work necessarily yeah and so uh, the question they have, there's questions of that too. Like if you uh, if you if you keep expanding, expanding, and then you just reach the end of your expansion, and and you know some people think that that's the American economy right now is that we we are slow, we're slowing down in our growth because we've just reached a point where it's time to slow down. Um, yeah, uh, or, or, or and yeah, I don't know. There's a lot. There's a, there's so much, and I would I, I hope all of that gets explored. Now that is one thing with them when they're doing an overarching story this way. The, 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 all these issues that we're talking about would be wonderful to explore. The problem is, if you're doing episodic television, you can explore a different one every week. Right. If you're doing it as one story, a lot of times you're just exploring one or two themes. And so that is the one thing I don't like about switching to a more modern vein of storytelling, is we we're not going to get these... We're probably not going to get these very small single episode stories that are just about this one race that functions this one way and how it's a mirror to our culture or whatever. Yeah. It, it, it's funny. I, I think there's something interesting that's happened in television. And I kind of wish a show like a star, a star Trek or, or a, a Marvel or DC show would help kind of bring us back a little bit. Um, you know, we used to have just the purely episodic television, like the original Star Trek shows, where there's no real character depth, no character growth, no, you know, ongoing storylines. We've now gone all the way to the to the other end. But I think there was a sweet spot for a little while around, like, the late 90s and early 2000s, where I think of, honestly, like, mid-seasons of Buffy, the Vampire Slayer, is one of the best examples of this, where you had a big bad... And you had an overarching storyline, and individual episodes would be somewhat episodic, 
but would also be driving that larger storyline forward. And sometimes an episode would be really a, a heavy focus on that, and other times it would be a a small focus on that. And right. I think you're right. That's probably not what we're going to get here. But like, I would love a show like that where like it is kind of back to let's explore the space anomaly of the week. But all the time, we're sort of slowly uncovering more about the larger plot and and seeing how that's playing out. Um, yeah, I, I can't. Can you think of any shows that today are doing that kind of storytelling where it's 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 kind of halfway in between? Uh, there are. I, there's 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 definitely like a lot of the procedural shows uh, because mm-hmm. everything is now overarching story. Almost every procedural show, whether it be an NCIS or a NYPD or whatever, any of the, I don't really watch any of them. Castle, for instance, or uh, there's a new show, Stump Town, that's on right now. Like all mm. these procedural shows, they do a sort of villain of the week, but they're also trying to do character arcs. And so, what what you end up getting? One of my favorites actually is um, Burn 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 Notice. Burn Notice. Thank you. Oh, that show is so so good. It is so good, and it, it's from a few years ago. It ended. Three or four years ago, maybe I don't know. No, um, it, it it was uh, it's very much in that sweet spot. I was discovering it's like yeah. early mid two thousands. Yeah, it's it's great. It's great. Uh, I, not, I think it's a little later. I, I may be wrong, but I think it's in the. I think it made it into the two thousand tens at least. Uh, I'll um, look it up while you keep talking. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. um, it was seven seasons or so, and it's really I love that show, and that does a really good job of every week is a specific heist. But then every week has they do they do a funny thing on there where it's almost separated. The very beginning of the episode is always about the overarching story, and the very end of the episode is about the overarching story. Like the first two minutes and the last two minutes, and then the middle thirty eight minutes are about the the heist of the week. Right. <laughs> and I I, th- I thought that was a lot of fun. Yeah. It uh, it started in two thousand seven, ended in two thousand thirteen. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So I think Burn Notice was a great example. Uh, there there are still shows that are doing that. But there are other shows that are doing something different that I think scratches the same itch uh, that you're talking about of balancing things without Uh necessarily having a villain of the week. Because villain of the week, heist of the week, whatever, I get kind of tired of that, especially in the Buffy shows. Like, I love the Buff, I love Buffy. It's great. But sometimes when you've got to spend 10 minutes dealing with whatever werewolf or frog monster or whatever is there <laughs> that week, I'm like, I don't care about this guy. I know she's just going to stab him with something and it's going to be over. And he's, and, and a lot of times they're literally, it, it, it's that exact thing I was talking about it earlier, uh, where you have that 38 minute point where you've got to have a fight. Um, and that, that Buffy was very big on that for the first four seasons. After that, they kind of, they, they departed that. Yeah. Um, but what I love and the best example I have of it is Watchmen. Watchmen. Mm. Have, you, have you watched it yet? I haven't. No, it's on my, uh, I, I was about to, and then someone told me about this show that isn't getting really talked about, but that maybe one or two of our listeners have heard about called the Witcher. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I need to watch that first. And then, yeah, I'm going to go. Gotcha. The Witcher is next. And then the Watchmen. Watchmen is the best show I've ever seen. I, I, I just stay it hands down. Best show I've ever seen. Uh, but it does this thing where everything is about the overarching story, but every episode is telling a character story. You have an arc and you have a climax and you have a resolution and you have a moral and you have a story in every episode, but every episode is a part of a tapestry that is, is building the overall show. Um, now, now they don't have villains of the week. It's not about that. It's there's not a fight in every episode. You know, it's yeah. it's it's about, but there is still a story in every episode, and that's what I think is important: is having a story in every episode, not necessarily a different planet or a different nebula or a different being, um, but having having your character go through something and having them learn something or. or, or a, uh, learn something about themselves or whatever like that's what's important to me as a viewer now now i again that's my stranded panda thing where i think i'm not the average guy when it comes to that i think there's a large portion of the populace who loves when the arrow takes out his arrows and shoots them and the flash catches them and throws them at the bad guy i don't know what they (laughs) do on those shows but like i mostly find those shows to be pretty you know uh empty when it comes yeah. to like well and i don't i take that back 
a lot of times the overarching stories have 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 depth, but they take so much of my time because there's like a lot of these shows, and I, I pick on the DC shows because I think they're a great example of it. Uh-huh. But there are 22 episodes, and you could tell the overarching story in about four. Yeah, but you just. It, they do that burn notice thing where it's like a couple minutes at the beginning, a couple minutes at the end, you're, you're hearing about this overarching story, but they're always taking 18, 38 minutes of my life to tell about a story I don't care about. See, I think, I think, and this is interesting, and, and now we're, we're pretty far off our main topic, but I'll, I'll kind of make, we sure, can make yeah. one or two more comments and then, and then close out. Um, here's, an, I know here's an issue where I actually, I know I disagree with you. I love the first season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., because to me, the first it, it's what I what I describe of it's day in the life. You know, I want to know what is a day in the life of Buffy the Vampire Slayer like. What's a day in the life of a low level person in the MCU like? Um, and and part of why I love that first season of Agents of Shield was because it was that because it was all right. It's Monday and we got to go do this mission. It's you know next week and we got to go do this mission. And over time, slowly unraveling that, oh, hey, there's this thing that's kind of behind everything that's happening. Mm. Um, and I, and I, it's part of why I love the stranded panda idea is because, uh, not to go too deep in the metaphor, but I think what we're discover is we're not all the same kind of panda. Oh, we yeah, got a bunch sure. of different kinds of panda and we're all stranded. In, and, and it's about uniting our differences. And I, I think it's one of the things I... I, I was funny. I was talking with Jacob about this um, on the the other podcast episode that will probably come out before this one. We recorded it in our car um, about kind of the end of 2019 and our favorite favorite stories and stuff like that. Um, kind of similar to what I know you and Jeff did. What, one of the topics that we got into was the fact that four years ago I did watch all of the Arrowverse shows. Because I watched all the superhero media that was on television. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because Me too. and and Arrow wasn't like I thought the Netflix stuff was the best, and Agents of Shield was a step down, and Arrowverse was a step down. But I watched all of it because um, mm-hmm. what I was going to do when I did had all the Netflix I could watch, you know, like now there's so much, including like I want to see the Runaways, I want to see the Watchmen, I just haven't had time. It's an amazing time we are like would you have thought that 10 years ago there would be so much like at least watchable to good comic book content on television that you wouldn't be able to watch it all no definitely not yeah it's it's great i mean i remember when i was a kid i'd watch things like gosh you remember viper yeah it's like stuff like that that was like real weird and but it was just like kind of a superhero show. Like it wasn't even really a superhero show. Yeah. It was like a guy with a, a car that had superpowers basically. And it's just <laughs> like, much. Hey, it's, it's basically night, uh, an updated Knight Rider. If anybody doesn't know, it's a show called Viper, but it yeah. may be like the car, of the Viper, which I don't like cars really. So that's <laughs> weird. That's a weird part of my childhood. But yeah. um, yeah, it's like, I, I'd watch that every week because it was just a, it was, it was a kind of a genre show, you know? Yeah. Well, I think cause we're getting to the point now where, we don't just have genre shows. We have um, a family drama where they happen to have superpowers, and that's um, the Umbrella Academy. We mm. have um, a political thriller that's about corporate and politics and the media where they happen to have uh, superpowers, and that's the boys. You know, um, it, it, it's kind of an amazing time that we're living in now in terms of just all this content that's out there and. Now we're going to have yet another in Picard. So um, yeah. do you have any kind of um, final thoughts you want to say about um, Picard and what you're excited about or, or maybe even like stuff you're concerned about or just general thoughts? I'm just excited. I really don't have any final thoughts. I'm just excited and I'm uh, having a blast writing all this music about Star Trek and I'm going to continue doing that even uh-huh. through – I'm going to try and I don't know if it's going to – I'm going to pull it off. It kind of depends, uh, you know, not being episodic like we talk about. I'm going to try to write a song about every episode of Picard as it airs. <laughs> Good luck. Right? But it, it, it's very possible they won't be episodic, and it's going to be very difficult because there won't be a, a – if they don't do a good job of telling a story in an episode, it's going to be really hard to find that, like, heart of that story if there's no story. If yeah. it's just a series of expositional events. Like, I really hope – they're able to give us stories every week. Uh, and that's sort of selfishly as a guy trying to write songs. <laughs> it, it may be something where like, once you've seen the whole first season, you can say, okay, there were these five different plot threads and I'm going to write a song about, you know, 
the the robots and like uh, the the droids and what happened to them. I'm gonna write a song about Picard. We we never even actually talked about this today, but the um the young woman who features prominently in the trailers, who we think may be Picard's daughter or oh, someone yeah. in his family or someone like that. Like that 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 you might wind up doing that. Um, uh, but for now, why don't you um give our fans a rundown of how they can find um your music, your other podcasts, and just kind of all the great things you're doing because you're. Uh, you, you've built a pretty awesome little media empire now that we're uh, pretty excited <laughs> that star, uh, uh, superhero ethics can uh, hop onto your coattails a bit. Oh, so man. Uh, talk, talk about uh, how all the different places people can find Matt Carroll content. Well, uh, very shortly. Uh, first of all, uh, you can find my music under Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. Uh, but that is not where the Star Trek music is going to be. Uh, the Star Trek music is actually going to be under a band I call The Garage – and we are on Spotify. Right now, there's one Star Trek song up. There's Spotify, Apple, Google. If you go to any of those places and you follow The Garage, look up Just a Drone by The Garage. That's the song. Just a Drone by The Garage. Whatever streaming service you have, uh, it should be on YouTube, Apple, Google, all those places. And you can follow the band, The Garage, there, and you should be able to get the album as it comes out. It's all... It actually... Eight, uh, se- seven of the ten songs are already up on sp- on uh, SoundCloud as well. So you can search nice. uh, The Garage, Just a Drone, and just uh, find The Garage, the band, um, and it's on there. I think it's uh, SoundCloud.com slash The Garage Geek Music, I think is the uh, title of that. But, um, but, but, uh, but the podcasting, these are podcast listeners, and that's where you can find, uh, if you like Star Trek, really the thing you want to look for is the Star Trek Universe podcast. That's what we're, uh, we're also releasing the songs there every week. So, you know, awesome. if, if you're interested in that, if you're interested in more about what I have to say about Star Trek or more of what I have to say about, uh, uh the music, check out the Star Trek Universe podcast. Um, awesome. And soon strandedpanda.com, which I'm hoping will be, a thing by the time this comes out. When's this coming out? Uh, it depends how fast I edit it. Probably, um, uh, my, my hope is that this will be coming out before the first episode of Picard launches. So probably early, uh, I think Picard launches at the end of the last week in January, and this will come out like a couple days before that. Okay. Um, well, I hope to have it out. Strandedpanda.com will be a thing before Picard comes out. So, if you guys awesome. uh, just go to strandedpanda.com, it will have all of our podcasts uh, for the Stranded Panda Network and uh, as well as um, the the music. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Um, I'm really grateful that um, um, I, I started this podcast a while ago, I told you, in part because I'm um, being inspired by what you did with the Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast. Um, and I now have three podcasts. You and I have a podcast about the Orville Universe um, and I have now gotten started this uh, Star Wars podcast that hopefully will be really kicking off in earnest at the end of January. Although we do have a couple of ep- – we put up a couple episodes at the end of uh, 2019, went on kind of hiatus because we were having trouble locating a, a regular co-host. I think we've got that sorted out now and we'll be coming back. Um, so, And we're really looking forward to, to having all these podcasts also be part of that Stranded Pan- uh, uh, Panda Network. So yeah. for Superhero Ethics fans – um, we'll soon be at a point where all you have to do is follow the link from one of our episodes. It'll take you kind of back to that mothership. And then from there, you can find all the different stuff that's out there. Um, one, one, you know, we, we, uh, we didn't even discuss it much, but, uh, another one that, um, uh, I know good friends of yours do is the DC on screen universe podcast. There's the Watchmen. There's, there's all these different, uh, shows out there. Yeah. Um, and like I said, by the time this airs, strandedpanda.com, you can find all our stuff and, uh, what what I really loved we did the we were doing the Orville and we're doing the we did the Watchmen this year which was you know only ten episodes or thirteen episodes yep. of podcasting but the show was only ten episodes I love the idea of doing short runs of shows like that like the Orville when it's on or um you know uh, the yeah. Watchmen when it was on so I'm excited I, I know to do you more were of that. I know you were like me really into the boys and I'm hoping you're going to help me do uh, something about the boys when the season of that's coming out next year I would year. like to do that uh, yeah. I hate that we missed the missed missed it on the on the first run, but we will we will do something about it. Well, unfortunately, part of the problem with this is that um both Matt and I, as much as we would love to spend all of our time making podcasts for you, our loyal listeners, we have to do this silly thing called making money at That's our true. other jobs. Um, but you fans can help take away that problem with great things like Patreon. Um, mm-hmm. I know um, Matt has uh, there's Patreons for all the other podcasts that Matt discussed. 
There is also one for this podcast. The uh, sh- it's good. links are going to be in the show notes, as well as our place to get superhero ethics merchandise. Um, and we will give you some great things just for being a part of that. The other thing that you can do totally free is just take 30 seconds uh, and write us a review. Um, um, if On Apple, iTunes, on um, Podbean or Stitcher, any of the places where you get podcasts, they probably have a way to put up a review. If you, if you like this podcast and you're willing to do so, if you can give us five stars and just say a word about why you like the show – uh, or, you know, even if you want to give us three or even one star and tell us why you don't like the show, all those things help us know how to make it better for you, but also it helps to make sure other people are listening. And if you're like me, um, Matt, I don't know if you feel this way, but to me, part of what the Stranded Panda idea is, is that I used to be someone who would go to one of these movies, go to watch a TV show, and I would have so much I wanted to talk to about it, you know? Oh, I would, yeah hang out with people and be like, oh my God, did you see this? Let's talk about like, you know, um, data and is he a real person and what was said in that trial? And people would say like, excuse me, sir, can you just pay for your groceries? Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) You know, and I always felt stranded. And for me, what the podcast gives me, and especially with with you, the fans being able to interact more, um, what the Facebook groups give me, I know MCU just started one, we have one for superhero ethics. Uh, for you, the fans, I, sp- I think you feel the same way. We want to build spaces where we can talk about these questions, where we can get into these debates, where we can keep it going. Um, so please give us a five-star review. Tell your friends about it. Forward it to people. That's how we grow the community. That's how we grow the conversation. That's how we don't get, uh, we're not those stranded pandas. Um, so please do you know support the show however you can. Support some of the other great shows that Matt talked about. Uh, on behalf of Matt and myself uh, and Jacob, uh, who I know wishes he could be here. Uh, thank you guys all for being a part of this, and have a great day. I'm just a drone Trying to make it in this life on my own is in my head, no cue to call home. I'm just a drone. I never want for freedom, I was happy to serve. I found comfort in the millions and billions I heard. Cause in the hive, you're never alone. You're surrounded by family, you're home. I never had to navigate this complexity. What I'd machinate was spoon fed to me. But along came the enterprise, and my wees turned to eyes. I'm just a drone, trying to make it in this life on my own. No voices in my head, no cue to call home. Just a drone This life of being one It's fraught with choices and questions But answers, I have none There's this limit to my processing power I can't be sure what might happen this next hour What's it worth to be an individual If it hurts, it makes you so damn cynical I guess I'm willing to pay that Because I know I can't go back I'm just a drone Trying to make it in this life on my own No voices in my head, no cue to call home I'm just a drone It's so tempting to let any voice come rushing in I'm so lonely A strong voice to take the lead and tell me who they think that I should be. life on my own No voices in my head, no cube to call home I'm just a drone Trying to make it in this life on my own No voices in my head, no cube to call home I'm just a
drone.